All right, welcome you two. Hello, everyone. This beautiful afternoon. Admit that this light and this. We should be good. Uh, maybe give me a, a nod or whatever if the YouTube is streaming okay. All right, welcome back to the Water, Wetlands, and Watersheds um, seminar. It's spring 2024. We're almost at spring break, right? Like this week is not spring break. Next week is not spring break, but then after that it is. All right, so I'm going to ask us to start off by just remembering two or three things about what we learned about last week. What we learned about last week is it might be a trick question. All right, so what happened last week? Caves? That was two weeks ago. That was pretty cool, yeah, right? How about last week? Waves? Nature-based. Oh, it's a trick question. We didn't have seminar last week. Y'all had to either, well, you could watch anything that you wanted, right? Any, yeah. any semester from, pre, any um, presentation from previous semesters. Or did anyone go to the Water Institute Symposium poster session? No, that was too much. That was too much, too difficult. So you watch them on YouTube, and everyone submitted an, a, their own individual report of a previous semester's presentation. So okay. So how about give me one thing that you learned last from from your submission um, from last week? They all be different. Destin, what did you do? Wh which one did you review? Um, it was a presentation by Dr. Mark Laughlin. Uh huh. Dr. Um, Daniel McLaughlin, right? Yes. Uh huh. It was about the nexus between geographically isolated wetlands. Right. And yeah. whether they're protected under law, right, yeah, by the law jurisdiction of the Water Act. Yeah, it went from when Donald Trump was president and then he, he has to like reduce funding allocated to protect uh, isolated wetlands and the research aimed at uh, showing that uh, there is a nexus between those isolated weapons and then they need to be protected. That's right. So yeah. That was one of the implications of the site. Thank you, Justin. All right, one more. One, what else did somebody watch that was totally different? Yes, yeah, I watched the nature-based solutions. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I found interesting was uh, there was sort of some historical understanding of how weapons protected uh, infrastructure, even in, in like the early... Part of, I think it was the Netherlands history. Uh -huh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So they had an understanding of the influence of wetlands and, and storm mitigation. So, all right, awesome. All right, so we heard too about wetlands, right? So I'm sure you all watched a bunch of stuff. It is the wetland seminar. We have wetlands again today. So I am very pleased to pre uh, present our speaker today is Dr. Sarah McMillan. I think she's going to be talking to us about wetlands as well. Um, Dr. McMillan is an ecological engineering professor and the Department of Ag and Biosystems Engineering at Iowa State University. She's also a professional engineer. So who in here is in the engineering department? A couple of engineers, and we got a couple of soil water science, a couple from even business, sometimes journalism. So you're going to do your PE? Any PEs, professional engineers? Yeah? On that track? Or you already are? Oh, no, I'm going to be. On that track. track. All right. I, I'm not, I'm not yet. That's why you're still here learning. So she has expertise in river and wetland restoration, conservation practices in agricultural lands, and stormwater management in cities. And really what Dr. McMillan does is try to connect the activities of humans on the landscape with the natural ecosystem, with current work on restoring ecosystems to improve water quality. And I think some work on connecting social and sort of environmental justice uh, approaches to agricultural and ecological uh, landscapes. I'm not sure if you'll talk about that today, but um, with that, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. McMillan. Thanks so much, everyone. Super nice to be here, and I'm really excited to talk with you a little bit about wetlands in the Midwest. And I have a bunch of slides to kind of con contextualize these and help you kind of orient yourself um, to what the kinds of environments we're talking about up here and hopefully give you a bit of a flavor of some of the challenges and opportunities for both conservation and restoration in an agricultural landscape that's pretty heavily influenced by altered land use, altered hydrology, uh, altered inputs of nutrients and other potential contaminants. So let's jump right in. And as I go ahead and get started, I'd like to first acknowledge our awesome team who's been really, you know, as we all know, graduate students are the the um, the secret sauce and how these things get done. And I'm going to share work from some really awesome students we've had and current student at the end. 
Um, Danny Winterlay just finished up her PhD and she's been doing some really fantastic work on integrating a lot of the water quality benefits that we're going to talk about today. Um, Megan Chupak, also a master's student, um, who's been, I'll share her work and she just recently graduated. And the last but not least, our um, current master's student, Ian Chesla, who's been taking the next steps as we're trying to understand some of these complex interactions. I have been doing this work um, with a lot of my awesome collaborators at Purdue, Jake and Laura, um, and then also collaborators a little bit closer to y'all in um, kind of the mid-Atlantic and Southeast, Greg and Mike, um, expanding our team and really trying to go wider across the agricultural Midwest with some really awesome collaborators doing work on birds and modeling, and so thinking about these multiple ecosystem services. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, I don't need really to say too much to this crew about why we think wetlands are important and what they do, but I do love this slide because it shows my favorite wetland uh, that I did a lot of this work at. Um, this one is in Indiana, the very large depressional wetland that has a lot of open water. You can see lots of um, live trees in the background, but also a lot of standing dead trees that um, are changing a lot of things related to carbon and nutrient um, dynamics in this system and probably others around. So let's um, talk about how and why we have moved away from a landscape that kind of looks like this to one that looks a lot more full of corn and soybeans and other kind of intensified land use. So in our agricultural Midwest, I've kind of zoomed in, here's the Great Lakes, if you can kind of see my mouse, um, Michigan. Yeah. Wisconsin. So I'm now really pretty much right under the eye in Iowa. I used to be about right here in Indiana. But what you're seeing on both of these graphs is, or these maps rather, is a indicator of um, two things. Number one, on the right, these are what we call the different types of soil drainage classes. And so in Iowa and in a lot of the agricultural Midwest, we have what's called subsurface drainage. And essentially what that means is these systems and these states used to be fully wetlands and a lot of saturated soils, a lot of prairie ecosystems, particularly in the places where you see a lot of this gray color. So here's um, a big chunk of that in Iowa, a fair bit in Indiana and Illinois. And then if you kind of compare those gray areas over here, these are the places where we've really intensified that drainage of the landscape. And that means digging in channels to, to drain the landscape, but also installing perforated pipes underneath, not unlike um, how many of the wetlands were drained in Florida, but also how we drain stormwater in cities. We collect all this water it moves relatively quickly and it, it he heads to our river networks and, and quickly downstream. Over the course of time, this kind of all happened in the, you know, over a hundred years ago. So this is kind of the legacy which with which we're left. And there we go. Come on. Um, we've really lost a lot of our wetlands in this part of the part of the world in about 50 to 90 percent, depending on what state you look at and what resource you look at. But it's quite a lot. And so there's a concerted effort to restore wetlands, to create wetlands and to create a lot of these services back in the landscape. As you can imagine, these wetlands have incredibly altered, or our landscapes rather have incredibly altered hydrology, and that is related as well to how these wetlands function. So I've just kind of showed you a little bit here about um, how these systems kind of work in this kind of engineering version of a little schematic, I guess. Um, but what we're showing here is this gray line. This is that tile drainage pipe that I showed you. It's pretty shallow, only about a meter deep in most cases. And it really quickly routes water into downstream ecosystems. In this case, we've shown a wetland because I'm going to kind of talk to you about how we're putting wetlands in to kind of intercept this flow of water. But you've got a lot of changes in the way that the land and the water interact in, in these places. Um, tile drainage not only moves a lot of water very quickly, it lowers groundwater tables, and it also causes pulsing hydrology that can deliver pollutants, including excess nutrients to a lot of these downstream water bodies, including the wetlands that we're trying to utilize as nutrient treatment sinks. So these wetland functions I'm listing here are kind of what you see all the time. And we know that these wetlands provide many, many services. And what we're doing in our group is trying to understand and measure some of these. And I will say some are easy to measure, some are not, 
all, however, are very complicated and complex interactions. They don't exist in a vacuum. And any, many of these things have feedbacks upon other functions as well. So for example, think about wetland vegetation. If you were designing a restoration, I heard one of you guys talk about a nature-based solution uh, talk. Maybe they were talking about some of the restoration efforts in different places. We can, as engineers, come in and say, plant these types of plants. We can select vegetation for certain functions, which is one of the things we're really thinking hard about as part of our wetland kind of restoration strategies. So they can be planted, they can be selected, but they can also come into a wetland in response to altered hydrology, changing temperatures, disturbance. So wetlands can be a, a cause or they can be, you know, the, the response, right, of what's changing in our landscape. And then this vegetation selection is really important because it has a whole host of cascading effects on many different services that are listed here. So it impacts evapotranspiration rates. It can take up and assimilate nutrients. It also can return carbon back into the ecosystem. So then that would fuel some of the microbial um, metabolism that's happening in the sediments. It can change light patterns and light penetration. So you can imagine that can affect how much photosynthesis is happening. And that vegetation can also be a great home for wildlife, or it can be not so great and provide limited food and limited shelter and limited refu refugia from predation. From predation. So vegetation is a key uh, knob that we are trying to turn in some of our understandings of how we might do restoration in a different way. So take a look in into how we're doing this in Iowa. So this little cartoon is kind of illustrating where these wetlands happen in the landscape. So we're zooming in really um, intentionally on the water quality function of these wetlands and kind of thinking more about that than any other of those other functions we've listed. So here's how the design works. We essentially think about a, a watershed and up in these uplands, like on this left-hand side, there's a lot of these tiles that are smaller going through the fields. And then you can almost think of these bigger tile pipes as like our headwater streams or our first order channels. They exist. Oh, go ahead. In the Midwest, tile drainage is so obvious. And so like, so it's that little tube is like a drain. It's like a PVC pipe or something. Why is it called a, I, I don't know the answer to this. It's not a quick, is it called a tile? Cause it used to be made out of like, Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's called tile drainage because it used to be out of clay tiles. So early days of putting this into fields, there would be hand dug drainage ditches and hand installed pipes that were literally sections of clay tile that were like, you know, a few feet to many feet long and, you know, maybe six inches in diameter. And those would be then like placed inside so that those clay tiles are kind of the historic context and you can find them around. They're still out there in the world for sure. All right. Thanks a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Please jump in if there's any questions. This is a very uh, weird landscape in, in for, if it's not something you grew up in. So I'm trying to do my best, but if I miss something, please let me know. Um, so just to kind of understand, like this is a watershed, a small one, but a whole watershed that's dr that's filled with these small drainage tiles and it's all underground and the water moves relatively rapidly to the outlets. And so where we put these wetlands is where they start to emerge into a channel. And then that's what we try to do to collect all that water and store it for um, for a little bit longer, increase residence time, increase contact between water and active sediments. So this is what it might look like in a slightly uh, more artistic rendering of how this looks in plan view. So here's some tile drainage outlets coming in. Upstream of that, you might have a watershed that's a few thousand acres, right? So it's not insignificant how much land is being drained by these and how much water is moving into them. And then it almost looks like a little baby reservoir, right? We've got some open water in the middle and some kind of, you know, wiggly shoreline that's very shallow with both emergent plants, a lot of um, floating algae and things like that. And then we create this dam structure at the bottom and that's what holds that water back. Here's a, a picture, it's a little blurry, I apologize. Um, trying to find some of these from aerial imagery is not super easy, <laughs> um, but you can get a sense of what this looks like from the air. And here's our, we're at the bottom, lots of open water. This is early in the season, but kind of summertime where you see still some um, emergent vegetation on the edges, but a lot almost looks kind of pondish in this case. 
a little zoom in of what that weir looks like. Now we're standing kind of at the downstream end of one of these big wetlands. And you can almost tell on this case that you got some um, shallow land in the back where you're starting to see more emergent vegetation in the main pool. And you've got some overflow across this weir structure. And in this case, which doesn't happen all the time, they've actually created a bit of a transition zone with some rock and wood to try to create a little bit more of a gentle reconnection into the stream network. Every one of these is designed a little bit differently, but it's a pretty heavily engineered system. You've got steel structure here for the weir, a lot of rock, um, dug out and widened um, channel a little bit to create that space and reflooded kind of almost like a reservoir behind that dam. If we look at how constructed wetlands are built in Indiana, just a few states away, it's an entirely different design approach. There's different management strategies and there's a different climate. So in Iowa, we're kind of right in the middle of the U.S., but we are pretty dry by comparison to some of our eastern sister states in this midwestern agricultural landscape. So if we go to Indiana, we're a good bit wetter. There's more trees. There's less historical prairie. So you see constructed wetlands kind of look like this, where we have almost a fringing forest. And then this is a, a drainage similar inputs of water, but we've got a different vegetation story. So this is also an ag treatment wetland that drains a similar landscape. You just can't see the farm fields behind it. This has taken heat of the summer, lots and lots of productivity. In the, in the spring, you can see this thing, a little bit different view, but very flooded and a lot of um, kind of open water in this case. So it definitely, these are very shallow systems. Hydro periods are very dynamic. Um, and there's a lot of um, growth and productivity happening in these ecosystems. So with that context, let's dive into some of the work we've been doing and some of the questions we're trying to answer. So we're really focusing on historically on water quality and climate, and then we're pivoting more into these other impacts on humans and wildlife and things like that. So really trying to think about how design can really be used to our advantage to maximize functions when we look at that modified hydrology, that pulsing hydrology where, um, by the way, this is one of our, our student, Megan, who is standing in the wetland that you just saw with the fringing trees and the flooding in the early spring or the late spring, and it's completely dry by end of summer. So really modified and dynamic hydrology. We're also thinking about how we might use them for irrigation during our changing climate and maybe needing some of that water when these uh, lands get really dry. We have a lot of invasive plant issues that we're um, trying to understand. So you'll see a theme of invasive species kind of emerge throughout the rest of this talk. And how does that influence how nitrogen and carbon are cycled, both in terms of water quality improvements by removing nitrogen, but also changing the carbon story. And then lastly, yeah, trying to dig a little bit more into those multiple environmental outcomes, things like carbon and nutrients, but also water, microbial communities, plants, birds, humans, et cetera. So our goals really are to use as many of the interesting kinds of new technologies as we can. We've been working by my colleague, Jay Cosen has been doing some really cool work building and kind of fabricating some in-situ sensors that we are using in these ecosystems, doing a lot of lab and field-based experiments, which is going to be the bulk of what I'm going to show you today, um, and trying to use some of the new computational tools like explainable AI and machine learning statistics to really kind of figure out how all these complex interactions work. So to start off, let's go into, I'm going to keep an eye on the time, um, uh, some work from Megan, uh, really focusing on what are the factors that influence greenhouse gases in two of the wetlands. And actually, she's got three technically, but two are connected of those wetlands in Indiana that have very, very different geomorphologies. So here's her study sites. She worked in an, that agricultural treatment wetland that I showed you with the very... Um, uh, dynamic and variable hydrology, the large depressional wetland with the um, trees around the edges that are kind of on their way out and some uh, forest in the background. This is a very uh, a much bigger system and um, has a lot of forested buffer. And then 
slightly connected to this larger depressional wetland is a smaller one that's only about an acre in size. And it also becomes a lot more um, intermittent, similar to the ag treatment wetland where it dries up in the summertime. And so we wanted to kind of look at those drying effects by with a similar kind of um, more natural inputs. I will say, though, that even though this ag treatment wetland is getting that direct input from agriculture, our two wetlands on the right are situated in a heavily intensified managed ag landscape, right? They are still living in the context of a lot of excess pollution of both nutrients and other organic compounds and chemicals. So while these are kind of our somewhat our natural replicates, they're definitely not unimpacted. So let's looking at some of the basic water quality characteristics that we start with when we think about are these wetlands actually different? And there's some pretty distinct differences that emerge quickly in their water quality. So they are clustering by their type. But one of the questions we want to know is why? Why do we see all these things? Is it just a function of the vegetation or are there other factors at play? Um, if you look at this blue wetland, I'm going to use the same color scheme for a while. So I'll just orient you to that. The blue here is the agricultural treatment wetland. This big red smush right here in the middle is that larger um, depressional wetland. And the intermittent wetland is down here in kind of this yellowy color. There's fewer data points here because, oops, I'm so sorry, that wetland dried up and we were unable to measure water quality consistently because there was not water available. Um, but what is interesting is that these nutrient concentrations, so if you squint and look hard, you can see ammonium and total dissolved nitrogen loading high onto this PC axis this way. You've got a lot of the carbon, um, metrics kind of falling out in here where you see high DOC on this axis this way. Um, and maybe even a little bit of an indication of some changes in carbon quality or maybe even some nutrient changes as we move into this intermittent one. But that one's a little bit harder to show because there's only a few data points. We then looked at the similar approach using some redundancy analysis to compare those water chemistry um, outcomes to what we are seeing in terms of greenhouse gases. So what Megan did was she measured um, gas accumulation in this water column using um, pretty standard techniques to actually just measure, um, collect samples and, and bring those back into the laboratory and almost measure the, the dissolved gases directly. And so these are concentrations, not fluxes, but it's helpful to kind of understand that these concentrations would kind of then be um, similar to the next step of thinking about flux out. So if you see a high concentration of methane in the water column, that is correlated and would lead to a high flux of methane loss most most of the time. So um, essentially what we so found- for, for oh, the, re Sorry, the, the redundancy analysis, so the idea is that like the, the blue things are the gases that you measured, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. And I think because maybe they haven't seen multivariate stats before, like the blue- Oh, okay, sorry. No, it's okay. The, uh, the blue lines are these gases that are coming out, and then like the the symbols and the um the dark and the black arrows are like from the water quality from in the water uh, in the wetland itself, right? Correct. Yep. So all of these are m collected from the wetland itself, and there's like basically taking this information. I, I think of principal components as just kind of a way to see what correlates with what, but we did not put any of the greenhouse data, gas data on this plot yet because we just really wanted to look and see how those differences in water quality might play out. So this is almost like a fingerprint, if you will. And then we take those fingerprints and kind of overlay them into what are some response variables. So now you can get like what redundancy analysis. I don't know if this is a great way to explain it, but to me, it feels like which variables are most important and which ones are redundant, meaning which ones are not useful. Yeah. And you can also think about how these arrows orient with different factors. So if two arrows are in the same plane, so we look at methane coming out this way and DOC plotting right next to it, that shows that those two are probably pretty highly correlated in a positive way. If you see mm -hmm. methane and look over here, nitrate, those two arrows are in the same plane, but opposite. So that means that they are correlated, but in a negative direction. And if you think to your biogeochemistry, you know, if there's nitrate around heterotrophic metabolism. Those little bacteria are going to use nitrate to fuel their metabolism. Methane um, and through methanogenesis is a less energy intensive process. And that will be kind of further down 
the line so that either later in time or further deeper into the sediment. So that's how you can kind of think of those. What's interesting in this particular graph, which we kind of show some conflicting information later, is that if they're orthogonal, meaning a kind of a 90 degree angle, they're not really related that well. Oh, geez, I keep touching that thing. And so that means to me that this nitrate and nitrous oxide product, uh, emissions don't seem to be correlated that much, particularly with this data set. Yeah. And that kind of intuitively doesn't seem right, right? Because nitrous oxide is being produced as a function of that denitrification process. So that suggests that maybe some other factors are more important controlling that flux of nitrous oxide. So let's dig into some of those a little bit more and we can hopefully make sense of this stuff. So here's some of them that we thought were interesting and important to look at. So I already pointed out DOC. We also measured a ton of indicators of not just the amount of carbon, but also the kind of carbon it is using some optical tools and some basically UV vis spectrophotometers. That's how we're getting this absorbance at 254. Also SUVA 254 is basically taking that same absorbance and dividing it by the total carbon. But then also using some um, optical stuff to get things like the humification index and the fluorescence index and things like that. So those are just a little bit more detail. I won't go into too much about those, but we are trying to understand a little bit of these nuances of what does the quality of the carbon tell us versus just how much is there. So those are kind of like the overall, like what's correlated with what, but they don't really tell us anything super predictive yet. So she went in and then tried to aggregate these by sampling date. And I think these are a little more easy to understand. And again, I'll orient you to these graphs real quickly. Um, We've got all the sampling data organized by site within the wetland. So for example, in A, you see five little blue points. That means there was five locations within that depressional wetland where she sampled. Oh, I'm sorry, that's the agricultural wetland. Five locations within that wetland that she sampled. And similarly, all these are different locations within a wetland. And the green are simply coded as positive correlation, red, simply as negative and decreasing correlation. And some of the key things that I think are fascinating here to think about is that carbon pops up in an increasing way for many of the methane um, concentrations that she saw. So um, you see green popping up for A, C, and F. But then some of the other, um, you know, and it kind of makes sense too, is that we see this total nitrogen similar to why we saw nitrate being negatively correlated with, with methane, likely because of that redox competition. We also measured some sulfate, and this is an increasing interesting thing here because some farmers are actually adding sulfate as a nutrient, which is another conversation altogether. But we did measure it because of that, and we saw a decreasing uh, correlation with methane for that as well, which is also likely driven by redox competition. When we looked at our um, kind of some of the more of these um, methane and now a little bit around nitrous oxide production. This, what seemed to be an orthogonal relationship with, with nitrous oxide and nitrate actually turned out to be slightly positive, even though it's just pretty variable and it's not super consist consistent. It is con significant, but um, just barely. <laughs> so we're digging into that a little bit more. So how does all this kind of come together? I'd like to just keep going in the sense of time is that what we kind of saw was that as these bigger wetlands, what's happening, we think, is that this open water is allowing carbon to be kind of degraded by a lot of sunlight. And it's while there's a lot of production, that, that sunlight as well as the algal production is creating this really labile form of carbon that is available for microbes to use. Those microbes are pretty efficient at removing that um, carbon and turning it into smaller and smaller pieces that now methanogens can use. And so we're seeing some higher methane emission rates from those depressional wetlands that aren't seeing that huge pulse of nitrate. In our agricultural wetland, not only do we see nitrogen causing some changes, but we see a lot of the shade from the, uh, the surrounding trees and the really dense vegetation such that we see high amounts of biomass and this increase in nitrous oxide production and a decrease in methane. So interesting kind of connections between plants and sunlight and what fuels microbial processes. So we kind of wanted to dig into that in a little more of a mechanistic and um, experimental way because a lot of things are correlated and there's complex interactions. So um, one of our uh, graduate students, Danny Winter, just who just finished her PhD this past winter, looked a lot at 
many aspects of this. And one of the experiments I'm going to show you today is one where she did some interesting lab work to kind of do the the best she could to isolate some of these interactions between carbon and community composition in terms of the two response variables, denitrification and greenhouse gas production. Okay. So this is a complicated little graph that she borrowed from a classic textbook or a classic paper rather. Um, and the idea here is that methanogens and denitrifiers, they are all heterotrophs generally, right? They can do similar things, but these denitrifiers are facultative. They would rather use oxygen than nitrate to get more energy, but when they can, when nitrates around, they can use that and they can use a lot of different types of carbon and these products from polymers can be used by them. Methanogens are a little simpler. They need that carbon to be decomposed and moved further down the chain before they're able to use it. So some of these interesting um, questions around vegetation and carbon supply really matter uh, at the type of carbon it is. When we look at just bulk carbon, we're taking that entire group of all these things and just putting it in one number. But what we really want to understand is how does this carbon change and what does that do to different processes related to the microbes and what they are able to accomplish? So I will just go through this really quickly, I suppose. But the idea is if we think about just denitrification itself, not even that whole biogeochemical gradient, we have energy gains that are not even uniform across each of those little steps of that happen through the denitrification process. So this is important because if you look here in the middle, we have this nitrous oxide production happening. And so that is another potent greenhouse gas. It's about 300 times as potent as CO2. So if we have an inefficiency in this process, we're going to potentially cause excess climate impacts because of that nitrous oxide emission. And so that was one of the things she was really interested in understanding. So her design back to that big depressional wetland, and she targeted some patches where there was a monoculture of three different plants. Um, this first one here, Phalaris, that's reed canary grass. And here we've got Biden's fondrosa, that's a um, it's called devil's beggar tick, and it's kind of like a four, but it's a little bit woody stemmed, but a lot of really, you know, kind of leafy material on it. And then another um, grass, and I can't even pronounce that word, but it's a another type of um, uh, native grass, not an invasive grass. And that one is um, barnyard grass, and that's down here in the bottom. So basically collected soils and plant residue, and then also put that residue out in litter bags to see how that litter decomposition changed over time and how that would affect. So complicated experiment. I'm not going to show you too, too much. So the key takeaway for any of the ecologists in the room, this was a classic home and away experiment. Um, have home, meaning the soil in which that particular plant grew up in that monoculture of soil, there was controls of that, and then additions of different litter to all those different um, soil properties. The reason we kind of did the switching was that there's a lot of change of vegetation as these systems evolve. So invasion of reed canary grass is very common. It's happening across our region and it changes a lot of the dynamics of both you know, the carbon in the soil, but also how it affects the hydrology, dense, dense roots of that particular plant. So we really wanted to understand that a little bit more closely. And so that piece was kind of an interesting twist to this experiment. And she really wanted to see how this changed over time was this litter decomposed and we kind of moved further down that, that ladder of decomposition. What do these guys look like? So here's some pictures of them. You can kind of get a sense that this reed canary grass has a pretty dense, if you look down here, this root structure at the bottom, there's just a lot of um, rhizomes and they grow vegetatively and they make these big monocultures that are almost impossible to really change once it's established. Not great habitat, how dense it is. You can see that there's just a little, it's difficult for um, birds and other kinds of um, wildlife to actually get in between the, the stalks of that plant because it's so tightly packed. Barnyard grass is a little more clumpy, um, a little taller, more of a um, single stalk and less dense root structure. Not great at outcompeting once reed canary grass gets in, but not too bad either. It tends to maintain a little bit of a patch behavior once it's there as well. Uh, this is our forb. You can kind of see that kind of leafy structure in the woody debris underneath. And when you kind of open that up and you start to kind of look at how that biomass decomposes, that's what it what it looks like. And so these are some of the pictures. This is a picture actually of Danny taking that litter back into the lab and processing it for her litter bags. 
Okay. So I'm going to jump into what this did and what are some of the results. These graphs are a little much, so bear with me. Um, but lots of things here. So let's talk about what we all have on all these graphs. So I'm going to show you the same graph and I'm going to kind of step through different pieces of it. So the first panel up here on the top, this is total denitrification as measured using bottle assays in the lab and measuring it using a denitrifying, denitrifying enzyme activity assay. So basically a settling block for any of you who are doing this work, but if you're not, essentially all it means is we take soil, water, bring it back into the lab, and we use uh, a chemical inhibition to help us measure that nitrous oxide production directly because N2 is impossible to measure without an isotope or something else because there's so much of it in our environment. Um, she also measured N2O production directly by a paired control that didn't have that inhibitor. So that's how she got this number. So this is simply a ratio of how much of that incomplete to complete denitrification happened in each of these treatments. So you can think of these as a bunch of replicate bottles that have the same soil and the same water, and then they're measuring these different things. So there's that ratio of the total amount of denitrification to the flux of that N2O only. Oh, geez, my mouse is sensitive today. I apologize. And then this bottom panel is directly measuring methane production in each of these bottles as well. So the first two, denitrification and the, the N2O flux are pretty short-term experiments. They take about a day. I think the measurement time period is around four to six hours um, where you get that fast rate happening. Methanogens are slower growers and they take more time for that redox gradient to make them actually start to kick on and do the uh, methane production. So those bottles were about a week long. So what you can take away from this graph, so the first bit I'm gonna talk about is the plant type. So what was the resident plant community doing to cause changes or see what can we see from that? So we found that when we looked at that particular plant community, where it was, reed canary grass, barnyard grass, or the um, beg devil's beggar tick, that, that forb, that plant type by itself without any sort of re uh, amendments really explained about 50% of the variance, particularly with related to denitrification. What's also fascinating and interesting, and if we look you know, at this denitrification, we see a big pulse after we start to add residue, which suggests there's some competition or that maybe even this fresh stuff is just not bioavailable yet. It's too fresh. This was just cut plant material, so it's not ready to be decomposed by these guys. You need a little bit of processing for that denitrification to be able, those microbes to be able to use it. And across all of these denitrification pathways, we saw that our reed canary grass performed the worst. It had the lowest rates of denitrification. Um, and that when we looked at methane production, it also had the lowest rates of that. So here's our methane production under the PA. That's that reed canary grass, the invasive. The other ones are pretty similar. With regards to when we start now looked at adding the litter, it was not as in our multivariate stats that she did really didn't show as much of an influence on the denitrification, but a huge impact on methane production. So if you compare control, no litter added to all these other kind of green and yellow and brown colored ones, that blue, dark blue is always a lot lower than all of these. So the minute we add some litter, whether it's fresh litter or um, kind of decomposed litter, we see a big spike in um, and a stimulation of methane production, less so for denitrification. Um, so yeah, that's just an interesting kind of suggestion that we see some strong carbon limitations. We do see a pulse, right? Particularly in this four month where we add it, we almost double denitrification once we add that. So it's not insignificant either. And lastly, even though this fresh litter is real important for driving this methane production, probably because these guys are slow growers and we're letting these assays run longer for, a, for you know, this eight days. We're starting to see that decomposition actually happen over the course of that experimental time within the bottle itself. We don't see that same effect until we get some of that residue processing for denitrification. And when we look at the incomplete, we can see some pretty high rates of incomplete denitrification when we have litter added. That suggests that these are just becoming less efficient. We're just giving them a lot of carbon and they're able to just stop the process and go back for more. I tell my students a lot that they can think of these microbes as almost like sloppy eaters. If you have a full buffet, why would you eat your pizza crust if you can go back and get another piece of pizza? So it's like there's no reason to continue trying to make more enzymes and complete that process when there's just a whole bunch more food in there uh, re ready for you.
So really interesting kind of takeaway from this. I will say what we're now trying to better understand is if in bottles, we see this really high potential for nitrous oxide emission. When we look in our environments, we don't see quite that big flux. You know, we see this as like one to five, maybe 10% of the total N2 production in a real wetland. So what's happening uh, is really interesting. And how do we scale these numbers? I think is, is the next is a little bit more. We need to reconcile those and kind of understand that functionality a little better. Okay. So what do we take away from her experiments? A lot of words here, but I think the biggest thing is that really trying to think about carbon quantity and carbon quality as really as potentially important drivers rather than just only thinking about carbon quantity. And that there are complex interactions between the type of carbon you have, the type of plant you have, and what kind of outcomes you might be looking at. There's a lot of things going on there, but we did see that the reed canary grass generally had lowest amounts of denitrification, also not so great in completing that denitrification process, which is likely because there's just so much extra biomass and it's all pretty labile and available. Okay, last but not least, I will, I think we're getting a little close on time, so I'll wrap this up as quickly as I can. Yeah, um, like nine minutes, but that includes some question time, so. Okay, yeah. cool, perfect. So I have just a few slides from Ian. So what Ian's doing is taking these bottle experiments to do just that. Think about what does that little bottle do when we scale it up? So he's built some mesocosms and here's the, I'm actually gonna pivot to this one first and then I'll go back to that other slide. So these are what they look like. Um, we've got monocultures of these four different types. So reed canary grass is back in the back here. Number two, it's not doing super well, actually. Rice cut grass is a similar to barnyard grass, but a little bit more of a known quantity in terms of its denitrifying capabilities. Arrowhead is one that she didn't have at our wetland in great quantity, but a very common, more submerged aquatic plant, a little bit more similar to that forb. And then an unplanted control that looks kind of just like an algae kind of mess back there. But that's what that one is. Reed canary grass, interestingly, doesn't do great if it's always flooded. So this is a common uh, piece of management. If you want to get rid of reed canary grass, flood the water all the time. But not always easy to do. So what he's doing is measuring a whole bunch of things within the mesocosm scale. So we're looking at direct emissions of both nitrous oxide N2 and methane, and we're trying to partition it between these different places. So what we were doing before was really just looking at what's happening in the soil and trying to understand that and scale those numbers. So really just this N2O and directly what's happening from that methane piece. But if we take it as a whole ecosystem, we can do some similar kinds of measurements within the mesocosm. He's got some in situ kind of core incubations that we've been using. Um, and then taking these emissions from the water column, both over just the water and over piece areas of the water that have plants to look at that net effect of diffusion from the water surface, kind of the similar what Megan was starting to work on at the big scale, but now actually measuring a flux out with these floating chambers. And then also trying to look at what is the plant facilitated emission. So plants have hollow arenchyma, those act like straws and just send a lot of gases out to the atmosphere. So really trying to do a whole system balance and putting it in a mesocosm scale is more tractable than trying to do it at a field scale. So he's finishing up probably in the next year. Lots of data are being number crunched as we speak. So still to come on how that is all going to play out. And last but not least, some of my new students here at Iowa State who are working on how do we take some of these ideas and think about them beyond climate and water and maybe think about birds and humans like a little bit, but mostly birds. So Evie is finishing up her master's right now and has done a lot of work on different types of bird populations in these wetlands. So back to those crep wetlands that I showed you at the beginning. What's fascinating about this, and I'll just orient us a little bit more to you guys down here, green means high potential for restorable wetlands. So we have a big pocket down here and where the Everglades have been drained, up and down the Mississippi River Valley, the Prairie Pothole region of 
of the U.S., northern area where we have a lot of old relic depressional potholes and little small circle type depressional wetlands. And then right here where all of that prairie wetland kind of ecosystems have been drained. So lots and lots of potential for restoration of these systems in, in these places. So just a little teaser, what is really fascinating is that yes, while we think of these as being built for water quality, they actually do host a lot of services for birds of concern. And it's hugely variable. Lots and lots of, of birds are there and not all are um, as many as you might hope or expect. And they seem to be really driven by those vegetation things as well. So what does the vegetation look like? How dense is it? Where are they? And then what does the shape and type of wetland um, do? Does it have a buffer around it? Is it got a lot of open water? A lot of those things that related to food supply and nesting location. So kind of fun to be able to talk and work with folks who are working on birds to be able to think, how can we aggregate and maybe quantify some of these multiple ecosystem goods and services? That's what EGS stands for. Okay. So last slide, let's take key takeaways. <sighs> Thanks for hanging in there with me. I'm really excited about these opportunities because if we can design for water quality, we can probably create other opportunities for conservation, restoration with these um, strategies, but that we really need to think carefully about what is happening with all of the other biogeochemical processes, but also thinking about storage and flooding. We didn't really talk a lot about hydrology because there's only so much time. Um, thinking carefully about vegetation as a design choice, but also as uh, something that is really largely affected by what's happening within your landscape is, is interesting and important. So we show that reed canary grass, which is an invasive plant, hard to get rid of, pretty pervasive, does not denitrify as well, also doesn't maybe create as much methane, but it does seem to be pretty inefficient at that denitrification that it is able to do. Some of the similar native grasses are generally better but they also are likely interacting with nitrate supply and redox. And it's really difficult to understand native grasses in all those contexts because there's just fewer of them. And most of the time they're in pristine places, which don't have as much nutrient supply. And lastly, we're really thinking a lot more about multiple stakeholders and how do we amplify our goals? What are allies and partners outside of our water quality world that can be, um, we can work together to achieve more? Um, one of my colleagues, Adam, who does all the bird work is said, let's just make the pie bigger. How do we increase the pie? Really trying to think carefully about that piece. So with that, I'll stop and hopefully there's time for a question or two. Great, let's give Dr. McMillan a round of applause. And we'll take questions from the room first. Let's see if anyone on Zoom pops a question in. This is the part where we wait. We wait for the questions to bubble up. What can Dr. McMillan uh, clue you in on? So you're writing these um, these abstracts and you're trying to summarize your results. So yeah, question in the back. So the if we can go back to the really the, the one with the bar graphs. Yeah. Sorry, I lost you all for a minute. I apparently got kicked out or my internet didn't work for a minute. So can you repeat the question? Could you go back to the graphs that had like the three different um, plants and it showed like the denitrification, the NO. N2O N2O. and the methane. Yeah, 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 of course. All right, maybe. This one. one. You can swap yeah. displays to because you were on your slide sorter view. If you can swap displays to. Oh, sorry. How about okay. that one? Perfect. Yep. Okay. Sorry about that. Go. What's the it. question? Yeah, I was just confused. Like looking at the axes, like on the bottom, and then uh -huh. looking at the added plant litter. Like, what are what's the difference between? I don't know. I'm just confused. Like how it's like. Are you adding plant litter to each? One or I don't know. I was yeah. Just for like yeah, this is a complicated experiment. So I apologize for kind of breezing through that part. So I think easiest way to think about it is we collected soil from a particular spot. And then, so that's kind of the un, 
littered control. That's this dark blue line. So that's just soil, wetland sediment from wherever those plants were at. So I feel like this, instead of saying plant type, she should have put like plot type or location because those are the like places where those plants were growing all the time. All of the other colors, the gray, brown, and yellow are where we added residue, the actual plant material to those bottles and then incubated them and ran the experiment. So all of the blue are just sediment by itself, no plant litter added. And then all of these other colors are where we've added different plant litters to each of these. So if you think about this Biden's, this was that Forb, here it is Biden's adding the a different plant, the native grass, Biden's soil adding the same residue that it's used to all the time. And then this Biden soil getting the reed canary grass. Think about that as if, oh, the reed canary grass came in and invaded that little plot. So that's how those experimental design was, was, was put together. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, that, makes, that makes the sense. Uh, we have a question from, perhaps, you know, this character, AJ Reisinger. From, oh, uh, hey, AJ. Hey, <laughs> AJ. So AJ to know um he's a great talk i'd love to hear more about sulfur and whether you thought about sulfur nitrogen dynamics through sulfide inhibition of denitrification specifically oh aj you are so asking all the hard questions um yeah we are not digging deeply into the sulfur stuff we kind of measured sulfate as like uh an interesting possibility typically we don't see huge sulfur rate uh, uh concentrations here but because of this addition of sulfate kind of being talked about in much of our agronomy colleagues, we decided that maybe we should check it out. And I can probably go back to that slide that had some of those data. Uh, maybe it was this one. Yeah, that we did see either, we didn't see a correlation with it with our nitrous oxide concentrations, but we did see an interesting relationship pop up with methane production. So I think that's an interesting question that we need to do a little digger, deeper dive into is how might sulfate modulate both the, the, and potentially compete with denitrifiers. We just have so much nitrate here that it seems unlikely but at certain places and at certain times, we do see nitrate go away, right? It doesn't stay in the tens of milligrams per liter all the time. It tends to, by late summer, kind of get down into the less than one, less than a half. So those times a year might be really important for those alternate pathways to emerge. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Let's give one more round of applause to Dr. McMillan. Thank you very much for joining us today. So next week, we have another virtual presenter. Next week, we're going to have Dr. Aaron Hotchkiss from Virginia Tech talking about stream carbon dioxide regimes across different ecoregions of the U.S. So again, welcome to come here and watch it. Welcome to watch it online and uh, submit your uh, abstract summaries and see you next week. Thank you, Sarah. Very much appreciate y'all you coming here, coming here to see us. <laughs> Sam, you're more than welcome to join us. Um, so yeah, it'll be, be great to have you. Yeah, I 